Tracy pulls into the parking lot where Rick waits with their daughters, Harper and Ava. She watches for a bit as they have fun, until Rick notices her and has the girls step out to meet her. Excited, they talk about their visit to Jackie's place, and Tracy confronts Rick about taking them to a bar. However, he quickly explains he'd only been there to use the oven, and the girls confirm this. After some conversation, Tracy ushers the girls into the car. Left alone, she and Rick discuss their holiday plan. She has the girls for Christmas Eve, while Rick gets them on Christmas Day. That said, they hug goodbye, and Rick drives off, shooting the girls a big smile. Harper, giggling, then comments on just how handsome and good-smelling her father is, prompting Tracy to take a whiff of her jacket and catch Rick's scent. The girls delight in this, and soon, they're out of the parking lot too. Later at Jackie's, Misty hands Rick the girls Teddy, Mr. Pinky, certain they must have forgotten it the last time they came around. Casually, she mentions that she might not be able to hold on to the bar for much longer, and Rick is surprised. He asks about the buyer she had, and Misty explains that their offer was too low. Without another word, she makes her exit, and Rick is left to consider his next move. Harper and Ava huddle over a drawing they made in their room, when Tracy suddenly comes in, and they hide it. Smiling, she asks what they're up to, and Harper reveals that their dad had asked them to write two wish lists, one for him, and the other for her, so they could both work on getting them the presents. However, Harper asks what they should do if the wish involves both parents. Tracy takes a seat with the girls, gently explaining that she and Rick are both on a tight budget. She adds that though she wouldn't want to make any promises, she would try her best, assuring them as she tucks them in. Hopeful, Harper and Ava decide to reveal their wish. They pull out the drawing, handing it to Tracy, and explain that their wish is to spend Christmas at their grandparents with the whole family, including both her and Rick. The girls admit they're tired of splitting the holidays, and also desperately miss their grandparents. They plead with Tracy who promises she'll think about it. After kissing them goodnight, she heads out, and the girls share a victorious high five. The next day, Tracy shows up at Jackie's with the drawing and asks for Rick. Misty calls for him, and he steps out the back. Spotting Tracy, he grabs Mr. Pinky, apologizing for not returning him sooner. Surprised to not find him playing, Tracy asks if he now bartends. Rick admits he does, on the side, explaining that Misty had talked him into it. Tracy asks if he still plays though, and Rick reveals that the band has had some issues for a while, but they still play now and then. Tracy hands Rick the drawing, recounting the girl's wish, but Rick can hardly manage a reply before she begins ranting. She insists that she absolutely cannot spend Christmas at her parents' place. Her perfect siblings with perfect lives all gathered for the holidays as well. She imagines it's already a houseful, with hardly enough space for more. She also reckons that her mother Mimi would dislike Rick even more after finding out that he not only played music at a bar, but also worked there. Suddenly, Tracy gets an idea. Since her mother already dislikes Rick, she'll make her look like the bad guy by insisting against Rick's visit. Rick is completely against this plan and tries to argue, but Tracy doesn't listen. She embraces him and heads out, leaving the poor guy speechless. What a handful. Tracy's parents, Mimi and Ed, are at the church when her call comes in. Mimi is very surprised, seeing as Tracy hasn't called in such a long time. She asks if something's wrong, but Tracy assures her everything's fine, narrating the girl's wish to spend Christmas with them. Mimi is thrilled by the news, but is taken aback when Tracy mentions Rick. She questions why he would be coming, pointing out that his presence would only be awkward and Tracy explains it's the girl's wish. Mimi offers that they make the trip without him instead, but Tracy explains that isn't possible. She notes that they would need to stay close to home to make the Christmas Day swap with him. Both Mimi and Ed are devastated, and Ed even considers allowing Rick over, but Tracy assures them it's fine. Mimi and Ed contemplate the issue, and Ed tries to convince Mimi that having Rick over is only a small price to pay, to see the girls after so long. Mimi however reminds him of all the hardship Rick had caused them, and how seeing him again would only be a reminder. Still, Ed urges her to think about Ava and Harper, and after a bit of reconsideration, she calls Tracy. Harper and Ava excitedly wrestle over the phone. They ask their grandma if she's heard about their Christmas wish, and Mimi happily announces to them that they'd reconsidered and would love to have them over, Rick included. With that, Harper and Ava celebrate, but as you'd guess, Tracy is far less excited. The next day, Tracy and the girls meet up with Rick. He has his luggage, and Tracy helps him load them into the car. She asks why they aren't taking his truck instead, and Rick explains that Misty needs it for her move to Florida. Visibly frustrated, Tracy points out that if Misty's moving, that means he's out of a job. 
Rick asks her to cut him some slack, reminding her that he hasn't missed child support payments for the last six months. Tracy lets it go, and instead asks where his Christmas presents for the girls are. Rick assures her he'll find them something, and, exasperated, Tracy pleads that they just get the trip over with. On the ride to Mimi's, Tracy lays down the rules, though the girls barely listen. She then warns Rick not to mention his bartending. Rick asks the last time she's been home, and Tracy admits it's been a while. Rick admits he hasn't been home in a long time either. Not like he ever had one to go to. Soon enough, the group arrives at Mimi's place, and the girls burst in with excitement. Inside the crowded living area, Tracy's sisters wonder whether Rick really will show up. They remark on how ridiculous that would be since he'd never put in much effort when they were married. Tracy walks in on their conversation and makes her presence known. She is warmly welcomed by everyone, and so are the girls. Rick comes in shortly after and receives a somewhat awkward welcome. Ed then asks Mimi to show them to their rooms. Mimi leads the pair upstairs, showing Tracy to a single bed on the landing. She informs Rick that he'll have to make do with the downstairs couch, however, as it is the only available space left. Tracy offers to take the couch instead, but Rick refuses, insisting he can manage. With everything settled, Mimi leaves them to rest before dinner. Mimi calls everyone down for dinner, directing the kids to stay in the kitchen, while the adults head to the dining area. Everyone gets settled at the table, but Rick arrives a bit late and sees the seats are all taken. He points this out, and Mimi apologizes, asking Ed to grab a folding chair from the hall, but Rick offers to get it himself. While Rick is gone, Tracy looks accusingly over at her mom, and Mimi promises it wasn't on purpose, but Tracy hardly believes it. Rick soon returns, and they say a quick prayer over the meal. Once the prayer's done, everyone digs into their meals, and Ed takes the moment to congratulate his daughter, Rebecca, and her husband Steve, on their sixth wedding anniversary. As if that wasn't enough, Rebecca and Steve share a huge surprise. Rebecca is pregnant, Mimi is ecstatic, and congratulations are all around. The family does some catching up over dessert, and Ed is happy to hear that everyone's doing well. Steve points out that Tracy hasn't said a word though, and asks how work has been. Before she can respond, Rebecca chimes in, guessing that she still works at the diner, and Tracy confirms this. Evan, Lydia's husband, then asks what she really wants to do, and Tracy admits she'd like beauty school. Steve encourages her to go for it, but Tracy argues that being a single mother of two, she couldn't afford such luxury. Mimi jumps in, noting that Rick ought to help more with the girls and asks if he has a job other than music. Rick defends himself, asserting that he does have a job. Bartending. Things turn ugly real quick, and Mimi is frankly disappointed with his job. She calls him out for actually being involved in the sale of alcohol, and Rick pulls a dumb one, pointing out that even the Lord had turned water into wine. Mimi isn't having it, and she quotes a scripture about drunkenness. Rick then reminds her she'd never liked him singing either, which the scripture commands. Upset, Mimi gathers her plates and walks off, bringing the dinner to an awkward end. Later that evening, Tracy confronts Rick about his behavior earlier at dinner, but he remains indifferent. He clarifies that he doesn't care what her family thinks of him and was only trying to get them off her back. Tracy argues that she doesn't care what they think either, but Rick doesn't believe her. Frustrated, she storms upstairs. Upstairs, Tracy finds the girls rummaging through a box of old photos. She joins them, and the girls explain they'd been looking for her wedding photo. Tracy then goes through the box and pulls out one with just her and Rick. Ava asks why there aren't any bridesmaids in the photo, and Tracy reveals that she and Rick had eloped. After explaining what that means, she packs up the photos and puts the girls to bed. Morning comes, and Tracy is woken by Rick and the girls' pleas to go sledding. She tries to argue that it's too early, but Rick manages to persuade her. Tracy, Rick, and the kids arrive at Rick's old house, where they plan to sled. Tracy notes how much better it looks, and Rick explains that his father had sold it to Mr. Babbitt before he'd passed away. Rick adds that his dad had left him his old Mustang, but he hadn't picked it up yet. Laughing, Tracy recalls how Mr. Babbitt would shoot at them for sneaking into his cornfield. Next, they set off for the sledding hill, which just happens to be right through Mr. Babbitt's old cornfield. Tracy, Rick and the girls arrive at the hill and are about to start sledding when they hear gunshots. It's an angry Mr. Babbitt demanding to know who's on his property. Rick raises his arms in surrender, explaining that he's the late Mr. Pruett's son, but Mr. Babbitt shoots all the more. Laughing, they head for the car and make a run for it. As they leave, Harper reckons Mr. Babbitt must not have liked her grandfather much. Laughing, Rick agrees. Curious, Harper asks why, and Rick explains that his father was a little mean. 
Tracy notes that he had always found it difficult to love or be loved. Ava comments on how sad that must have been for Rick, but is glad that he didn't turn out the same, and Rick and Tracy share a smile. The group heads out to a diner to spend the rest of the day, and Rick and Tracy unexpectedly run into an old friend, Ashley, from their school days. Tracy introduces Ashley to the girls, and Ashley asks all sorts of questions, eager to catch up on their lives since school. She assumes the pair are still married, and notes how much of a heartthrob Rick had been back then with the band. Ashley leaves after some time, and Harper suggests they head to the movies next. Tracy, Rick and the girls get home late, and are immediately met by a worried Mimi. She ushers the girls upstairs and narrates how she'd planned to take them horseback riding. She notes that she'd been trying to reach them all day, and Tracy explains that she didn't have her phone with her. With a sigh, Mimi suggests they both head to bed. Downstairs, Tracy vents to Rick about how outrageous it is that her mom still treats her like a teenager. Rick disagrees, however, claiming Mimi was really mad at him. He jokes that she'll probably add this to the list of things he's done wrong, along with eloping with Tracy and not quitting the band sooner. Tracy notes the seriousness in his tone, and Rick admits he's been doing some thinking lately. However, Tracy argues that if she'd made him quit the band back then, he would have resented her and everyone else. Rick agrees that may be true, but reckons they would still be together. Eyes filled with regret, they both stare at each other in silence. Up in her room, Mimi wonders why Tracy is still down with Rick so late, and Ed assures her they're probably just talking, and rightly so too. Meanwhile, Tracy expresses doubt that anything would have been different if Rick had quit the band, and Rick states he would have gotten a better job so she could have gone to school. In almost a whisper, he adds that he still could, and Tracy turns to face him. She asks where all this sentiment is coming from, and Rick admits he's made a lot of mistakes, but never because he didn't love her. He then pulls her in for a kiss. Upstairs, Mimi can't take it anymore and decides to head downstairs and get Tracy up to bed. Ed tries to convince her otherwise, but Mimi is determined. Mimi arrives downstairs to find the two kissing and is not happy about it. Angrily, she orders Tracy up to bed and Tracy can hardly believe it. She finds it so unbelievable that she and Rick can't hardly stop laughing. Nevertheless, Tracy obeys her mom and heads upstairs, Mimi shooting Rick a ghastly glare from behind. The next day, Mimi informs Tracy and the girls that they'll be going horseback riding at the neighbors. She explains that the others would be going Christmas shopping, as there were only enough horses for the four of them. Soon enough, Mimi, Tracy and the girls arrive at the neighbors, Brent's place. Mimi introduces him to Tracy and the girls. Obviously, up to something, she starts up a conversation between Tracy and Brent, leading the girls away to see her favorite horse. Meanwhile back at home, Rick plays his guitar, and Ed walks in, commending his playing. He takes a seat with Rick, and they strike up a conversation, Rick asking about his job. Ed talks about being a pastor, and the hope and listening ear he gets to offer others through it. Rick then comments that bartending isn't so different, and Ed laughs. He mentions that he's heard Rick's been looking for a job, and Rick confirms this, adding that having one meant he could finally pay him back for the wedding. Ed assures him he doesn't have to, reminding him that the money wasn't a loan. Rick muses that Mimi wouldn't have accepted the money anyway, given where he works. But Ed offers a different perspective. He teaches Rick that God puts people in different places for a reason, and that he could be just as important in giving hope to someone at a bar, as he would be doing the same in a church. Rick is genuinely surprised to hear this, realizing they hadn't gotten to know each other much before. After a pause, he asks if Ed can take him somewhere, and they head out to retrieve his father's Mustang. Looking over the car, Rick reveals he had always felt less valuable than it, and that had made him hate it. He asks Ed if he might know how much it's worth, and Ed tells him he doesn't, but knows someone from church who might. Tracy and Brent manage to keep up their conversation, and eventually head out to join Mimi and the girls. On the way, Tracy slips in some mud, and Brent offers to help her get cleaned up. Tracy is hesitant, but Mimi insists, and Brent leads her back inside to get changed. Mimi and Tracy make a stop at the church, and Tracy's still upset that she'd insisted on her changing into Brent's clothes. She asks why they're at the church anyway, and Mimi explains it's where she hides the presents from the kids, and that she needed some help wrapping them. Inside, Tracy talks about her meeting with Brent, and accuses her mom of clearly trying to set her up with him. Mimi doesn't deny it, and remarks that he's doing much better than Rick. Offended, Tracy calls her out for always trying to make Rick look bad, and Mimi turns serious. She brings up the incident with Rick last night and voices her concern. She acknowledges that both of them might have had a fun day out with the girls, but warns her not to forget all the hardship he'd wrought in the past, outplaying gigs for days on end while she was home crying all by herself. 
Tracy tries to defend Rick, but is at a loss for words. Instead, she focuses on wrapping the presents, but can't manage that either. Mimi then helps her with it, and assures her that she only wants what's best for her. She pulls her daughter into a hug, reminding her that she will always be there for her. Back at home, the kids, along with their parents, have a lively snowball fight. Ed comes out to join them, hurling fistfuls of snow at anyone in sight. Mimi and Tracy soon arrive, and Tracy joins in on the fight, while Mim heads inside, calling on Ed to follow. Once inside, Mimi asks Ed if he'd been able to talk to Rick like she'd asked, about letting Tracy go. Ed states that he had talked to Rick, about God and other things, but not about Tracy. Exasperated, Mimi asks how that helps them, and Ed explains he was just trying to help Rick, not them. Frustrated, Mimi storms off. Outside the snowball fight continues, then Brent pulls up, drawing everyone's attention. He explains he's looking for Tracy, and she calls a truce, going over to meet him. Brent hands Tracy her clean clothes, and she thanks him and stays to chat for a bit. With encouragement from Steve, Rick hurls a snowball at Brent, drawing him into chaos as the fight swings into full force. Mimi steps out to call everyone in for dinner, and spots Brent, who explains he'd come by to drop off Tracy's clothes. As you can imagine, Rick can hardly believe his ears, and receives a sympathetic pat from Evan. Meanwhile, Mimi calls them all in, inviting Brent to join them as well. Rick hurries to the table, grabbing the other seat beside Tracy. As is tradition, everyone at the table holds hands in prayer, before settling down to eat. Excitedly, Mimi recounts how wonderful her outing with Tracy and the girls had been, and Brent notes how good the girls were at riding. Rick chimes in, stating how proud he is of his girls, painfully making it clear he's their father. Realizing her error, Tracy takes the moment to introduce Brent to Rick, the father of her kids. This creates an awkward tension that fills the room, and Ed changes the subject. Ed recounts his outing that afternoon with Rick. Hearing that Rick owns a Mustang, Brent, with a hint of malice, remarks that keeping a classic car hobby requires a lot of money. Rick offers a witty reply, noting that Brent's horse hobby is just a tool for impressing women. Irritated, Rick then gets up to leave, his snarky comeback leaving Steve desperately trying to stifle a laugh. Tracy excuses herself from the table to follow Rick and catches up with him. She asks what all that was about, and Rick accuses her of acting different from yesterday, asking why she'd changed. Tracy then argues that they might just have been caught up in the moment last night, but Rick tells her that isn't true. He asks if Mimi has made her believe this, and Tracy denies it, but Rick knows better. Just then, Mimi comes in from the dining area, informing them that everyone can hear their conversation. Rick walks away, and Mimi tries to get Tracy to return to dinner, but she insists on going to bed instead, and Mimi gives up. Tracy listens from the landing as Mimi sings the girls to sleep. She tries to get some sleep herself, but a text from Rick, asking if she's awake, comes in. Tracy looks at her screen for a while, considering replying. Eventually she puts it away, settling to sleep. Morning comes, and Rick sits outside crafting a song on his guitar. Mimi steps out to him, face scowling, and he stops playing to speak with her. She accuses him of avoiding the family, upset that he cannot put up with them for just four days. Rick picks up on her frustration, highlighting how rude it had been of her to try and set up Tracy and Brent right in front of him. Mimi is unapologetic, making it clear that he'd had his shot with Tracy but failed miserably at it. She states that Tracy and the girls need someone who could be there for them, and Rick tries to argue he has been there. Mimi cuts him off, her voice rising as she reminds him of the time she'd driven down to Nashville just to take care of the girls, or of the times he'd run off on gigs, abandoning all his responsibilities. Mimi makes it clear that Tracy was theirs before she married him. She asserts that they are her family, and that they will always want what's best for her. Rick challenges Mimi on this, accusing her of only wanting what's best for herself, and not Tracy. Mimi isn't having it. She demands that he not speak ill of her family, when he hardly knew how to keep his together. Rick then states that he's doing all he can to fix his family, but Mimi warns him that will never happen under her watch. Rick points out that Tracy is a full-grown adult, capable of making her own decisions. Mimi agrees, adding that was all the more reason he should allow her to move on. Rick takes Mimi's advice, but hopes that she can do the same. Rick gathers his stuff, ready to leave, but Harper and Ava catch him just in time. They ask where he's going, and Rick tries to avoid the question, asking where their mother is instead. Harper explains that she's upstairs taking a shower, but Ava only asks the question again. Left with no other choice, Rick gently breaks it to the girls that he's leaving. He assures them they'll have a fantastic time without him, even promising a second Christmas celebration when they get back like always.
The girls look devastated, and Rick tries to explain that things just didn't work out. He explains that he and Mimi just couldn't get along, and Ava notes that they both share a love for music. Rick, however, gently explains that isn't enough. He pulls them in for a hug, gently kissing their heads before heading out. Rick loads his stuff into his father's Mustang, taking one last thoughtful look at the car before driving off. The girls come running after him, but Rick's already far gone, and he doesn't bother to look back. Meanwhile, Mimi gathers everyone around the Christmas tree for a family photo. She calls out to Ed, telling him to hurry up and bring the kids down with him. Just then, Tracy comes marching in, the girls behind her. She demands to know what her mother has said to make Rick leave. Mimi dismisses her question, however, noting that it wasn't surprising if Rick of all people had just up and gone. Tracy isn't in the mood for her mother's games and insists she reveals what she'd said to make Rick leave. Mimi finally responds, accusing Rick of driving a wedge between Tracy and the family. Tracy counters that Rick hadn't kept her from the family. Mimi was the problem all along. She admits that her mother is the reason she stayed away from home. Mimi then states that she couldn't just sit by and watch her make bad choices, and Tracy points to the girls. She reminds Mimi that they too were the result of her bad choices, yet she doesn't ever regret them. She pleads with Mimi to let her make her own mistakes, to let her live her life even if it isn't perfect. With tears, she tells Mimi that all she's ever wanted is guidance and reassurance, not someone to try and fix everything for her. Tracy asserts that even if her own daughters made the same mistakes she made, she would be there to teach them and help them through. Even if they married a guy like Rick, divorced him, and then found out they still love him. As she breaks down in tears, Mimi tries to argue that she was only a teenager then, but Tracy doesn't want to hear it. She admits that this overbearing attitude is exactly why they never come home for Christmas. She then storms off, taking the girls with her. In the tense silence that follows, Lydia confesses that she hasn't made tenure at her institute and will probably face a pay cut while she starts tenure track somewhere else. Evan adds that his school had promised him a raise, but now claims they can't afford it. Beth also has a confession. She reveals that she and Garrett have been in marriage counseling, Garrett adding that their daughter Maddie also has an eating disorder. Mimi, baffled and hurt, demands to know why they hadn't all told her sooner, and Beth explains that she would have just freaked out and tried to fix everything. Devastated, Mimi asks if there's anything else they've been hiding, and perfect Rebecca smugly announces that her life is problem-free, earning a sneer from Lydia. On an unrelated note, Garrett admits that he'd grown to like Rick, and the others all agree with him. Just then, Ed arrives. It's about darn time. Sensing the tension, he asks what he's missed. Mimi assures him she'll explain later, reminding him he can't be late for the Christmas Eve service. Ed then comments that Tracy and the girls must have already gone ahead. Surprised, a saddened Mimi watches from the window as they drive away. At the Eve service, Mimi is desperately fighting back tears as she delivers her solo. Unable to carry on any longer, she directs the church to chorus the last verse and takes her seat amidst the congregation. Meanwhile, Tracy and the girls make the drive back to Nashville, and Tracy tucks them in for bed. Ed soon mounts the podium to deliver his sermon. He admits he had a sermon already prepared for this service but would now like to teach something he considers more pressing, and begs their forgiveness as he begins. Ed teaches on the first ever gift at Christmas, Jesus Christ himself, the embodiment of his love. He talks about a conversation he'd had earlier that week with a divorced musician who did bartending on the side, and Mimi immediately knows he's talking about Ed. He talks about how said musician, in the chaos of the holiday travels, had forgotten to pack presents for his little girls, but instead of just going to get them some store-bought item, he decided to write them a song. Ed tells them he'd asked if the girls would appreciate a song at such an age, and though the musician wasn't sure they would, he wrote it nonetheless, certain that one day they'd look back on this Christmas and see how their father had given them something so meaningful. It's a song to tell them just how he loved them, something he had never heard growing up. Ed calls that a true Christmas gift and concludes by asking the congregation if they had love like that. Back at Jackie's in Nashville, Rick hands Misty some cash, and she congratulates him on his transferred ownership of Jackie's. Tracy comes into the bar and walks over to meet Rick by the counter. She proudly announces how she'd finally stood up to her mom and told her how she felt. She notes how he'd always run away from problems he didn't know how to fix, but reveals she won't let him run this time, admitting that she still loves him. Smiling, Rick notes that he's done running and admits he loves her too. Just then, Misty announces him as the new owner of Jackie's place and invites him over to the stage. Tracy is pleasantly surprised, and Rick explains he'd sold the Mustang for the bar. He tells her he's got something for her and climbs the stage with his guitar. 
He plays the song he's been working on for the girls, and Tracy smiles at the lyrics. Ed and Mimi walk in unnoticed, and even Mimi can't help but adore the lyrics. Rick soon notices the pair, and can't help but stare in fear. Tracy notices his look and follows his gaze to find her parents in the room. Rick finishes and heads downstage, pulling Tracy into a kiss. He looks to Ed and Mimi who give him an approving smile. Rick mouths a wholesome thank you as he embraces Tracy. Harper and Ava wake up and are thrilled to find themselves back at Mimi's on Christmas morning. Mimi hypes them up for the presents, but the girls reckon they won't be getting what they want this year. Mimi begs to differ, however, asking them to turn around. Behind them are Tracy and Rick all snuggled up, and the girls are ecstatic. Tracy thanks her mom for everything and Mimi smiles. The family gathers around the tree, kids and parents alike unwrapping presents with boundless joy. What a Merry Christmas!